Unpacking Mormonism and other religious trauma is meant for educational purposes only. Hello and welcome, friends, to an episode of Unpacking Mormonism. I am so excited to be here. My name is Alex. I am the producer of the show, and I am so proud and so honored to introduce the person here with us, Sarah Westbrook. Yes. Hello, everybody. I like Welcome how you waved at the camera, show. even though we're I know. Uh, not streaming. <laughs> yeah, none of you will see this. Maybe we should send this to um, Julia and America, and they can like do a short of me waving to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good shot of me. Okay, that's actually that. That is really funny. So Mason is not joining us today because of scheduling conflicts, which is actually hilarious because he has this entire week off. Um, but that is just the way our life is sometimes when you have as many children as we do and doctor's appointments and when your cell phones crash and all kinds of fun things. So he's not with us today, but I'm really excited about today's show because Alex, you actually posed some questions to me. A co I think it was a couple weeks ago, wasn't it? We yeah, could go. I reached out. Um, I had an idea or two that I wanted to throw by you. You know, I know, and and oftentimes I, I do love that you remind listeners that the reason that we speak so much of Mormonism is because that's the majority of the lens of time, you know, or the lens of time. That's the majority <laughs> of the uh of the lens that you you know have seen things through your life. But right. you know, for agnostic atheists and people who just run the gamut of their uh the, their beliefs there's sometimes i think a confusion of like what their centerpiece is correct like you know yeah. how do i see the world and you can see the world through your parents eyes or through the experiences you saw your parents have but then that just sort of led led me to the idea of like well you know there's some larger questions of like what the purpose of religion is and i don't think we're gonna necessarily break any new ground with my questions but oh man I know, right? I mean, they weren't like the, they, I wasn't like, hey, I think I just came up with something new, Sarah. This is the first time anyone's ever thought about this. But that led me to, you know, sort of the questions that I threw at you. And I think those would be helpful to our listeners. I know I would find them helpful. So I appreciate your time today. Well, and I, I absolutely love this because, you know, yes, most of our audience is either atheist or ex-Mormon. Um which is kind of funny because most people leaving Mormonism land somewhere in the agnostic atheist space after leaving Mormonism, at least for some time um, before going somewhere else. And, and many of us permanently, and I say us because I would say that myself personally, I'm not atheist. I would definitely say I'm a humanist agnostic, maybe humanism agnostic I don't know I wouldn't even know how to identify myself but that would probably be the closest for how I identify myself and so I think that your questions are are really profound and meaningful to our entire audience no matter where you align yourself because you're really talking about things outside of the religious lens um and and it just into the human nature of who we are so let's get started I'm excited thank you so much yeah. So what's your, what's your first question, Alex? So, you know, I, for just this part of it, I'm not speaking of like the morality and, and I think, you know, sometimes that's how this can be such a confusing place for people is when you start talking about broad strokes, such as morality and immorality, those things, you know, while we can think about them on a larger global perspective, what we're really talking about is like the people around us and in our community. I'm not often thinking about, well, who should I kill and who should I not kill? <laughs> who should I give access to, to resources and who should I not give access to resources? And so right. sometimes it seems like religion really is a, a foundation for us to understand what to eat, what to farm, how to relate to nature those things are embedded within it because there's an efficiency that comes with it. So I don't have to be aching about every single decision ever. Can you talk a little bit about why humans want to be more efficient in our decisions? Well, I'm going to actually go backwards just a little bit. So, you know, you talk about morality as defined by an outside source, 
Um, you know, so yes, for, for many, many years, and, and I would say even today, many religions will say that if you leave religion, you, you won't be a moral person. Um, I think I'm having microphone problems. I don't know if you heard that lapse there. I'm not sure what happened. Um, morality. If you leave religion, you, um, you're going to have morality problems. And that's just not founded in science. Like we're not seeing that um, substantiated as we look at those across all religious functions and including agnostics or, or atheists. And when it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we actually define morality as how the individual person hopes to live their life. And so, you know, some people's morality is going to, you know, I think that most humans automatically don't want to bring harm to other humans. Now, there are always going to be exceptions to the norm. We see that in people who have sociopathy um, or a lack of empathy. We're going to we're going to see some variations there. But for the most part, humans don't want to cause harm to other humans unless they feel threatened in some in some way. So when we're not feeling threatened, our morality is not to cause harm for most humans. But when we talk about some of the more intricate pieces of morality, things like maybe honesty or what does virtue mean to you or what does courage mean to you or, um, you know, what does theft mean to you? What does, I don't know, pick more morals, uh, more morals, more standards. And what you're going to find is that maybe for some people, their morals have to do with taking care of the environment or their morals are surrounding educating um, people, teaching people how to be literate, um, being able to provide for yourself, um, being able to provide for the poor, um, those types of things, educating, passing on generativity. So you're going to find that amongst each individual, um, we all tend to have different moral focuses um, which is considered a good thing that makes up part of our individual characteristics and, and personality and that it's very difficult for us as humans to actualize or see those in ourselves unless all of our needs on the Maslow's pyramid or the Maslow's hierarchy are being met. So just a quick reminder of what's on that Maslow's hierarchy. At the bottom, you have your physiological needs like food, water, um, sleep, making sure that your body is healthy. Your next rung up is your emotional, physical, and intellectual safety. Your next rung up is how you fit in and belong in your community and in your family relationships. So as long as you have all of those pieces and those bottom rungs intact in psychologically, physically, spiritually, intellectually healthy ways, then chances are most humans are not going to want to cause harm to other people um, and that they are going to be able to identify, recognize, and behave in ways that honor what is most important to them in a way that brings goodness and positivity into the world. Um, that might sound like a pipe dream for a lot of people. I hear a lot of people and see a lot of people say that the world is corrupt. And I would say that the world is wounded. For sure. Um, because when we see fear, when we see anger, when we see trauma, um, so when when there's starvation and deep poverty, when people are worried about where they're going to get their next meal, when we see broken communities and uh, when, when we start causing harm to other humans, it has a ripple effect and it messes with our Maslow's hierarchy of needs and hurt people, hurt people. Um, May, so let me, maybe can I ask a follow-up just real quick in there? Um, yeah. so in terms, cause when we're speaking of morality, you know, giving people access to resource, like I, I obviously, you know, uh, removing someone's life or, or, or ending someone's life as it pertains to this, this discussion is a, is a moral decision. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and to some level or at all levels, giving people access to resources 
can also be viewed as a moral decision because that is deciding mm -hmm. whether or not they can live or die. So you can see, you know, regionally, if you didn't understand that there were more resources, it could behoove uh, a group of people to say like, yo, those group of people over there, don't give them the resources because there's only so much and we need enough for us. Right. Right. Um, is that is that a is that a moral decision at that level or is that just a discussion of resources i think that we have this false idea that there's not enough resources to go around absolutely um, i 100% agree with that now yeah, but it, you know but was there a time you know when religions were being created that you know it made sense for people to say, well, that group of people isn't us, that group of people. And that yeah. is a, that's a sad, uh, that's a sad leftover, you know, yeah. you can see still perpetuating through things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's normal for humans to congregate in tribes. So an excellent book that describes this is Sapiens, um, I cannot remember the name of the author, Alex, if you want to look that up while we're talking so you can sure. uh, bring that up. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant book and it talks about how humans congregate in groups that are like minded, um, that feel safe. So we've got these cute little, I say cute, I don't know how cute we were, um, but these communities and that once those communities grow into a size, I want to say it's like over a hundred people suddenly we start kicking people that are kind of the outliers out because they start, it starts to feel like they are threatening us in some way. And then when the two tribes come together and there's this fear that there's not going to be enough. So if we're looking at our hunter gatherer days where, you know, we didn't have the same ability to access the resources. Um, people would fight over territory. Like we are not as far removed as our mammalian ancestors. Um, and, and I'm not talking about bonobos. I'm talking about wild tigers and, you know, birds of prey. We're not, we are not as far removed from our animal selves as we like to think we are. We are all subject to our biology. And so when we feel threatened. Our brain, our amygdala is going to respond in a way to keep us alive, to protect our young, to protect our small tribe. So like for Mason and I, our primary tribe is Mason, me, Eric, Brig, Hayden, Katie, Landon, Abby, Tyler. And we will do whatever we need to do to protect that family. And when when either of us feel like one of us is being threatened, you're going to see a side of us that would be, quote unquote, outside of the norm for us and yet completely normal in the sense that if you try and threaten my Abigail, I'm going to go ape shit, mama bear, crazy on your ass. That's just how it's going to go. And, and it's not because I'm an evil, crazy bitch. It's because my job as her mom from a biological standpoint is to make sure she makes it to adulthood. And there's a part of your brain that in the moment when it senses true danger turns off the uh, the thinking part of you, right? The part or the part that would hold back in a moment to decide like, hey, is this a dangerous situation or not? It just right. instantly goes to it, right? Right, now, it's just gone. And now, and that's, you know, oversimplified. That's the amygdala and frontal cortex that, that we've talked about multiple times. Now that is, you know, if you're talking to a neuroscientist, they're going to say, okay, yeah, Sarah is oversimplifying that. Yes, I am. And I know that. But if we got into all of the nitty gritty of what parts of the brain are doing what, it, it, we would lose the underlying point of when my survival brain alerts to danger, that is the amygdala of my brain, my frontal cortex, which is my logical, rational, creative problem solving, reasonable brain goes off and I respond in a fight, flight, freeze, fawn response. And this is why, and you know, when I recommend this podcast 
you know, to, to make it about, to make it about our little show for a second. Um, this is one of the reasons that I, uh, that I recommend the show is, you know, um, unpacking, if you will, the trauma. So you understand why you're having those responses is so vitally important because you miss out on a lot of the very exciting things in life. If you're constantly operating from a place of fear, flight, fawn, and not understanding why, um, and it, it, I mean, at a minimum understanding why, and then hopefully eventually s stopping those reactions, you know? Right. Um, and that's just, it's so powerful. I just wish people would focus so much on that. Um, because so much of our story, because of how we're wired is rooted in trauma. It, it just is an unfortunate thing, but if you well, have an extraordinary amount of joy in your life, in your life, you do start to dilute that trauma too. Yeah. Well, and we have to recognize trauma and biology. You know, because my my ape shit, crazy protective mama bear isn't a bad thing. And that's not from a trauma response. Right. That's biological. Right. Um, that has saved my child's children's lives on more than one occasion. You know, it's it's incredible to me. I remember, goodness, I think it was Hayden. He had been two or three stepped down onto the curb and in front of a moving car and without even thinking about it I stepped in front of him pushed him out of the way and then moved my body out of the way of the car split seconds I mean it was like slow motion for me I'm not some huge hero it wasn't like I was thinking that I was you know put on a superhero cape it was an automatic response to get my young out of the way and I remember um because Mason wasn't there it was a friend of mine and she was like oh my goodness you're so brave to have used your own body to shield Hayden's and I'm like that was not brave that was visceral it was an automatic response there was no part of my brain that was like I'm going to shield my son with my own body because if I had thought about it I guarantee my survival brain would have been like, don't step in front of that damn car. Like my, 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 my frontal cortex, I'm sorry, my frontal cortex would not have thought about that. My frontal yeah, exactly. cortex would have been like, grab him by the wrist and yank. Or, uh, or how do I feel about this person today? I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not a big fan of them today. You know, but right. I, this is, again, I think such an indication of why it's important to be, to be clear. You know, mm -hmm. you have to be in a place where, Again, like you're able, your body's able to respond in appropriate ways, right? Because okay. if you had a bad trauma response, you might not react in a way that care for someone else's safety over yours. Like the mama bear response might have been stilted, like where we have where parents, uh, like um, children of drug abusers and things like that, not to speak mm -hmm. ill of people who are struggling with an addiction, but oftentimes parents who are abusing drugs do not have the appropriate, uh, parental responses as it pertains to protecting their children. Well, and I think, you know, when we talk about utilizing substances, the issue is that we are dampening our brain's ability to respond quickly and, and protectively. Like we're, we're literally shutting certain parts of our brain or, or compromising certain parts of our brain so that we're not responding. And I would say that children who are actively exposed to parents um, under the influence of drugs or alcohol, one of the biggest risks is actually the emotional neglect that goes with that because the parent isn't able to respond empathetically in the same way while under the influence. And so certain um, parts of their brain are not wiring together because the mirror neurons. So remember, I don't know when we talked about this. It's been a while. But if I'm holding a, a, a baby and baby, you know, looks at me and goes, and I go back and then we, you know, the baby smiles and I smile and we, ah, and I feel this like nice little warm rush of endearing love with baby. That's because we've got what we call mirror neurons, which is the brain's way of connecting with this child. And that warm rush is the drop of oxytocin, which is the love hormone or the bonding hormone. And that hormone is literally meant for me to keep my baby alive, even though that baby is screaming for 20 hours a day. Um, it's, it's protective of the baby. And, and if I'm 
constantly doing drugs and messing with the hormones in my brain when I've got a newborn, I'm not getting those opportunities, which means baby's brain is not wiring in a way that sets them up for emotional and cognitive regulation later in life. Um, And so that's where we see a lot of trauma from neglect. Um, So, but to bring us back to your original question, Alex, really quickly, um, is that you had asked in that, you know, with regards to like efficient decisions and, you know, maybe that religion is telling us how to be moral. I think it's important to recognize that from the time we're little children, we depend on outside authority to direct our decisions, which is normal. You know, when when I'm two or three, I need a parent figure in order to tell me when something is safe or unsafe. I need my um, authority figure to tell me it's not safe to walk by the water until I know how to swim. I need a parent authority to make sure that I don't subsist on applesauce alone in order to grow into a healthy adult. And and during our teen years, we, we tend to kind of push away. We don't want as much to do with our parents. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. The world's most exciting podcast, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, New York Times best-selling author and National Radio Hall of Fame inductee, Michael Savage. I'm Michael Savage, host of the Savage Nation podcast, home of borders, language, and culture. Be here or be nowhere, the Savage Nation podcast. Catch the Michael Savage podcast on all podcast platforms every Tuesday and every Friday. Um, We tend to get a little rebellious and we kind of stretch our wings and, you know, we puff up our feathers a little bit and we try some things out on our own. And yet there's still kind of this expectation or this fear for most of us as teenagers that, oh, what's mom and dad going to think? Oh, what's mom and dad going to say? And so when when we kind of get in these religious societies or work societies or schooling societies or governmental societies where we are so used to an external source in forming our decisions, it's sometimes really difficult for us to begin to trust ourselves so that we can make our own decisions. And I feel like that's really where religious organizations or governmental organizations or any organization really for that matter can become so dangerous because if they are not encouraging and empowering us to truly be autonomous from the system, they may inadvertently or advertently, whichever the case may be, be trying to control our decisions. And that's, I think that's where we as humans tend to become over dependent on the outside authority to tell us what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, what is not moral, what the rules should be. I think that as we progress in today's society, because we don't, we don't deal with the same threats to our survival today that we did even 200 years ago. I mean, well, our and, our and lifespan that, is longer. Disease doesn't kill us in the a, same a way. Because I, I also want to, I think, I think I, um, I mis explained a small bit. You know, I think a misapplication of religion is a moral authority. And I don't just mean mm-hmm. from our perspective. I know that's pretty much for people who listen to the show. That's not all. That's not going to surprise you. Right. Um, but what? I just mean. I just mean in general, it's a misapplication of it across the board. It was never, I don't think, even meant to be that way. Moral decisions are a personal decision. Um, You know, whether or not you end someone's life, that really is only going to be like, it's only going to come up in very specific circumstances and only as it pertains to your direct family most times, right? When you start thinking about it in broad strokes, like you were saying, like, hey, uh, that those people, uh, 17,000 miles, that's a ridiculous amount of, of miles. Those people 500 <laughs> miles away, 
they are a they are a a, a moral issue. Well, how can mm-hmm. people 500 miles away be a moral issue to me? That makes no sense. And so I think a misapplication of religion, you know, even just fundamentally, I'm not sure it was ever even intended to be moral decisions. And if it was, whoever figured that out, like that's where we're getting on to something, right? Which mm-hmm. is how to activate your amygdala to make you do things that you wouldn't normally do. Or, and, and I would say not even things you wouldn't normally do, things that you shouldn't even care about. And right. man, you keep someone hungry, you can make them do anything, right? You can oh, make- yes. So yeah, if you're using those examples, so you know, you say 17,000 miles, that's a ridiculous amount of miles. It was, how, I'm sorry. That's so like the moon, I live, right? <laughs> right, I don't know. Um, right. How many miles though is it? So I live in the in central United States of America, right? How many miles is it from me to the Middle East? Because my husband's entire career was, I mean, what he did was support the United States and their efforts to fix quote unquote moral issues in the Middle East. And so, I mean, 500 miles, sure, it depends on what time period we are in. And if you look at some world religions, you know, especially when when we start thinking of like Catholicism or Islam or Mormonism, these are world religions, their impact is everywhere. And there is concern for world morality. Now, when we talk about atheism, you know, where, where it's like, okay, um, how do I find my morality or, or how, how am I able to make efficient decisions without an outside source? It, it really comes down to, we got to learn how to trust ourselves and identify when I'm making decisions out of fear and survival, when I'm making decisions because it's the social norm or an external authority told me I was supposed to, and when I'm doing something because it just seems to fit my authenticity best. You know, I think about the the Germans in World War II and how many of them, like killing and slaughtering Jews was 100% against their personal morality, but we got them to do it. And how did we get them to do it? Or how did Hitler and his regime get them to do it? Well, there was a threat to their family. It's amazing what we as humans will do when we start to threaten the safety or physiological needs of another human. Um, It's, it can well, get really can, disgusting really quickly. Can you touch on, because uh, we, we said for a moment that it's easy to manipulate people when they're hungry. Now, mm-hmm. not everyone who went along with the Holocaust or has gone along with atrocities has been in a position of being hungry or activated from a sense of feeling they were in danger. Some were activated from a sense of apathy of like, I don't care about those people. And some were activated from a sense of, yeah, those people deserve it. And I don't mean like, right. I want them to not eat, more like, I want those people to feel pain because reasons. Can right. you talk a little bit about that? So when when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you're kind of right now referring to things in what's going to, what I'm going to call the second tier or the safety tier. So safety tier is going to be your emotional, physical, intellectual safety. So your safety of resources, your safety of family, your safety of employment, those types of those types of things. The other piece of this is is brainwashing. So if you, from the time you were little, you were taught that the Jewish religion was a threat to you and most of the people around you believed that they were threatening you in some way, your lived experiences aren't necessarily going to be strong enough, especially before your frontal cortex is fully formed, to help you change your opinion on that. Um, So I just finished reading the book. Oh, goodness. All the Broken Places, I think. Let me look at this. It was a really good book. It's fiction. It is by the same author that wrote the book, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Let me see. I just got a new phone because everything got messed up. Let me see if I've got this. On here, All the Broken Places is the the book I just, All the Broken Places by John Boyne. Um, Fabulous. It is about the sister 
Um, so Gretel from the fictional story of the boy in the striped pajamas. And I absolutely love the way that um, John is able to describe how good people got caught up in doing these horrible things. These are good people doing things they never would have done, you know. So so one of the storylines, so Gretel is the child daughter of the commander of Auschwitz at the end of World War II. So they're gassing millions of Jews while she is there. And she feels horrifically guilty and responsible. But when she leaves Auschwitz, she's 12. So a reasonable adult is going to say a 12-year-old cannot hold responsibility for those events. And yet it traces, and, and based on real events, how they went to Paris, and she was um, shaved bald and had her scalp bleeding because the French blamed her. She should have done something to stop those atrocities. But she was 12. You know, how, how can you expect a 12-year-old to speak out against her parents? I mean, as far as she was concerned, that was the norm. She was told that the people on the other side of the fence were basically like farm animals. They weren't really people, and it was basically a farm over there. And and we do this same thing with different races as well. It's normal for humans. It's normal for animals to be suspicious and fearful of things that are new and different to them. And if we're living in a heightened state of alertness because our physiological, biological needs are not being met or we're in a constant state of danger, our brain is not going to respond with curiosity because our amygdala is fired up. We're going to respond with fight, flight, um, freeze, fawn. That's, that's just, this is, again, it's biology. And so when we look at issues like racism, one of the problems is you're different than me. I think I'm better than you. I have more power than you. Therefore, I can control you. Hey, look, because I can control you, I am more powerful than you. And then we create this nasty cycle that traumatizes us for generations generations upon generations upon gen generations and, and so you, the misapplication of uh of being able to categorize things efficiently you know you it, maybe it was uh, appropriate at one time to categorize people efficiently by the color of their skin it's not appropriate now right and so you're talking well, about it, so i'm going to actually that, pause you and say it depends on the environment because in medicine it's very appropriate to say what color your skin is because certain diseases are way more prevalent because of ethnicity. So it's it's very important for me to identify Abigail as black on her medical records so that they know to test her for sickle cell anemia. What I guess uh, I meant more from like a uh, an efficiency, like being able to say like, is this person good or bad quickly? Oh is not appropriate based on someone's skin tone, eye color, uh, able, like what their body looks like in general. Um, and it may be, and this is like where you get into some like, I, and which is fine because I love this world. You get into some hippy dippy stuff. Uh, it was <laughs> never okay. It was never okay. But it, at some time, as we look at history, we're starting to understand that that was done, not just because it was a moral thing, but because people just thought it was the right thing to do for reasons like we don't we don't even know the reasons right like someone was right. like oh those people are dark get them on the boat and ship them to another country it's cool um you know i think <laughs> well, I, like, depending on how you look at it no i don't know if it, i don't know if those people ever thought that was a moral decision if they did right. then then we're talking true evil that's true evil then right correct okay. well and and i'm gonna i'm gonna call that moral efficiency so moral efficiency right um so, but I would say, you know, put them on a boat and ship them. Well, I'm going to say some people were just pure evil and some people were responding in fear. But I would say go back even before that. You know, if if you've got people that are only traveling, I don't know, we'll say 
a couple hundred miles in their lifetime. And then all of a sudden, so the only thing you've ever seen are people who look like you and you kind of have your territories and then something in nature changes and you start to migrate. And then all of a sudden you're exposed to somebody who looks vastly different from you. You know, I think of like South America when, you know, the Europeans come across and they think the Europeans are Jesus because I'm going to assume they have really white, bright skin and they look rich and they came in a boat and the South Americans are like, whoa, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it, that's a shock to the system. Um, and I mean, humans are going to human. And unfortunately, humans so aren't always great. <laughs> then I have to ask you the question, you know, because when we're talking about trauma, um, we're talking about people acting out in ways that they probably wouldn't act from a healthy mindset. So is that all that evil, like as we think of it is, is that just someone causing harm because they themselves are in harm from trauma or it does true evil exist in your mind? Like people like evil with no cause. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think Mason and I actually covered what my idea of evil was once on a Sunday school with Sarah and Mason. Um, so I'm going to say that people doing things that harm others um, isn't always because we are traumatized. Um, it can also be because that's just what's been modeled for us. Mm. You know, if, mm. if I, you know, one of the things that, that I see all the time is, you know, kiddos coming up and they have the same political beliefs as their parents or the same ideals as their parents. You know, I had to kind of chuckle the other day because I was taking care of nieces and nephews and they don't go to McDonald's because McDonald's supports abortion. <laughs> and I'm like, um, you're like nine. <laughs> you don't even <laughs> understand what you're saying. Um, but I won't go to McDonald's while you're with me because that is not a battle I'm going to have with a nine-year-old, okay? Um, when your frontal cortex is more fully developed, if you come to me and you want to have that conversation, great. But I am not going to go on my high horse and my soapbox with a nine-year-old. Uh, not appropriate. <laughs> You're welcome, mother of that child. You know who you are. If you are listening, that's called love. <laughs> because oh, that was pushing Sarah's buttons. The babies oh. were saved that day, mom. Don't worry. The babies were saved that day. <laughs> yeah. The babies cool. were safe from Sarah's moral issues with that statement. Okay. Um, but my, my point being that, you know, when when the Europeans came to America, to the Americas and took over the native lands, were they taking over the native lands because they were purely evil? or because they truly felt like they were better and doing a great service to the world. I don't know. I mean, they, there's definitely been an issue with white supremacy for millennia. And, and when I talk about white supremacy, meaning privilege, because we were born with more technology, more opportunity. It's, it's, I mean, it, we're talking about birthright here, you know? It's, well, so I think this goes right into the question uh, here, which is then you can see where the spiritual drive or this idea that there's something out there that we don't understand. If you combine mm -hmm. that with this idea that we are, um, just as our nature, designed to continue to move about the world and, and, and develop it as we see fit, you can see how like those things together create like a really bad package of like, well, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do what I think what is right because I can do it. Right. Well, um, that's really, that's really kind of powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, the challenge is, is that our brain doesn't say, I think like, I think this is right. Comes from somebody who's willing to say, hmm, I might not be right. The brain craves knowledge. The brain craves being right. And so, you know, your your question of what, because you on this, you know, email you sent me, what part of the brain is in charge of like spiritual experiences and whatnot. And, and the answer, we've got a couple of, you know, uh, sources that will be in the short show notes here is that it's multiple parts of the brain that make up a 
spiritual um, experience for a person. Like we know that you get hormonal drops in your brain that give you those yummy feelings. You know, like in Mormonism, we talk about the still small voice and feeling warm in your heart. And I'm like, warm in your heart usually means that you've got an oxytocin uh, drop going on. And so you have this thought, it feels really good. You get some dopamine going on. So dopamine is your reward system. And then you get some um, oxytocin going on. And then there's a lot of confirmation bias. Our brain craves knowledge. It craves being able to say, this makes sense. And it will latch on to the first thing that makes the most sense the fastest, whether or not it is true. This is why optical illusions will get you. You know, have you ever been driving down the freeway or the highway? This happens all the time in Arizona because there aren't very many trees to break up the sunlight and you'll get that mirage and it looks like there's water on the road and the closer you get, the water never comes for when you're in the desert. Um, and it's just the reflections, but it looks like water. Um, and if you don't know that it's a mirage, and I remember being little and being like, Dad, why is there always a lake in the road and why don't we ever get there? And I remember him laughing hysterically at me and then explaining the mirage. And then I remember, oh, I remember like learning about that in school. Um, the brain is going to see that and say, that's water because it looks like water. And my experiences tell me that it's water. And so our brain is going to scan our lived experiences and use what we've already experienced, what we've already thought, what we already believe, and try and make sense of the new information in front of us. So, and, and then you're going to get all these hormonal drops that cause cognitive bias and, and whatnot to say, you are right, even when you aren't. And so it takes a very mature person, uh, usually somebody that has a fully formed frontal cortex. So that means somebody older, so females older than 20, males older than 23, um, to be able to really dig in and, and challenge um, that first impression of what we feel is right. So for example, I had a client that I was actually seeing today who said, you know, my father-in-law said this. And he said it because he was trying to point out A, B, and C. And my question to him was, what evidence do you have that his intention was A, B, and C? Oh, yeah. And he's like, yeah. and he goes, I don't, but I just know it. I was like, okay, oh well, yeah, why do you just it, uh, know it? To make it about the show again and why this show is important. You know, one of the things that this show has helped me do more than anything is to understand uh, how my perspective is not someone else's perspective and vice versa. And even communicating around that exact point, which is to say like, hey, I'm the person who usually sees this. So I'm assuming that you mean this. I know that's probably not right. And I, you know, you try not to be rude, but you're like, hey, you're the person who judges. You're judging this blank. And mm -hmm. so to make it about this show again, that th this show does help with that. And I and I hope people will take that away from that, which is the idea that you really have to try to understand the viewpoint of someone else and how when they are saying something, there's my, there might be a reason that you had no idea about that they're bringing that up. And you saying that I know that I know that the reason that you did that you're saying that is this you not only are you going to be wrong, but you verbalizing it that way has made it even worse. And that it's just a tough place to come from. Right. Because then you're going to fight over something you can't prove, oh, for yeah. one, because then you're going to argue about, well, you were thinking this. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. I know you were. No, I wasn't. I was actually thinking this. No, you weren't. And you're going to completely distract from the actual underlying issue. We call this mind reading, jumping to conclusions. And we got all kinds of words for it in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, we call them thought distortions. Um, like we can sum them all up in thought distortions there. Um, but one of the reasons of, of your, you know, question number four, Alex, was the other piece was, you know, where does this come from in the brain? Or what is the purpose of this like religious or spiritual drive? And really magical thinking and this, you know, I'm seeking the divine. I'm seeking 
this understanding, this religious understanding, or there's something out there that's mysterious or mythical. It's because we need stories. We need experiences. We need something to fill in the gaps that explains the unexplainable. And that's, I mean, we, myth in, in human evolution and understanding, it is as old as time. Like we go look and Mason and I, a year ago, so a year ago, right now, I think we left on October 10th. So like literally a year ago, so today's the 11th, I think, by the way, um, that we're recording this. So this will draw, oh no, it's, it's the 10th. My computer says it's the 10th, a year ago today. Hey, head on over to Amazon and buy your copy of Trauma Bonded, a true story of navigating attachments forged in complex PTSD by me, Sarah Westbrook. The mighty and resilient Merrimack River, carving through the communities of our great region. My name is Linda Lorden, proud president of Merrimack County Savings Bank. And like the river that serves as our namesake, we're a constant yet ever-changing presence. Because to us, it's bigger than banking. It's about powering communities and putting people first. It's about knowing where you came from and where you're going. That's Merrimack style. Visit us at themerrimack.com. Um, uh, recording day, Mason and I were flying to Italy. Um, so by the time you hear this, we were on a cruise ship somewhere in either Italy, Turkey, or Greece, um, touring ancient Rome, um, and the, and the Roman empire. Um, and oh my goodness, like the, the hieroglyphs, the art, the, it just, it's all mythical, like the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Egyptian gods, and the the crossover of that. And, you know, we kind of chuckle at some of that, the the amount of sex depicted in Roman god, Greek god, uh, Egyptian god art is hysterically amazing. I just I had to laugh at a lot of it, a lot of the gay sex that is depicted in all of that art, too. I, I just had to chuckle at a lot of it, um, because it would be something that would be completely taboo in today's religious societies, at least in the United States. Um, but, but to see that and to be able to just kind of go, oh man, that is that definitely an old idea that was, has been completely debunked, but it demonstrates that for millennia, we have been seeking stories and myth and magic and gods and something bigger than us to connect the dots, to explain the unexplainable. Now, I'm in no way saying there's no such thing as a God. I don't know if there is. Um, I've I've never experienced it. I've never had a near-death experience. Um, when you study near-death experiences, there definitely appears to be something. Um, well, I want to stop you there one quick for people who listen who to the show. The experience that you shared about um, you know, the, the baby that you lost, that mm -hmm. was very much a spiritual, I would say almost, almost a near death experience, not for you per se, but definitely death related. Right. There was um, a connection yeah. to something um, that I can't explain. Exactly. And, you know, and that's sort of what I was referencing in terms of like, you know, um, cause on this show, you know, we've definitely spoken of like, well, yeah, they were smoking something when they thought that happened, you know? And of <laughs> course, and that's funny, you know, but it's like, everyone has a story like that. Someone would very easily say that to you, like, Hey, Sarah, did you hit the whiskey, you know, before you went to service that day? And you'd be like, yes, I did, but it's not related. Um, but no, <laughs> I didn't because I was a TBM at the time. Right. So no but, substances you know, that day. <laughs> what I what I think is um, is unfortunate is that you know the desire to to understand or the desire to have a connection to the other, um, like it isn't just like is there a god or not. I think some people just refuse this notion that well, there's also that part of is everything connected and part of the same experience, right? You can't right. forget that part because those things work together like you that you can't have one without the other. You can't. You just can't. Well, and, you know, it's really what's really fascinating to me is so my uncle 
Um, he's actually my great uncle. And then my mother-in-law are both very fascinated with kinesiology and energy work and those types of things. And I don't know, I was very skeptical of it for a long time. But as science comes out, we are starting to to recognize that atoms and molecules work together and in, in ways that we're just beginning to crack into an understanding of and that it makes sense that my body is going to respond to the things around me. And so, you know, it, it, can you tell if I have the flu by, you know, asking my brain a question and pushing on my arm? I don't think so. But am I connected to the other living things around me in a way that I can't really put words to? Yeah, I think, I think that we are. Um, and, and I, you know, we need time and we need more experience before we can really verbalize it. And that could be hundreds of years or thousands of years or millions of years from now, who knows? Um, and so I think that allowing space in your brain to say there's something out there, there's a, or a lot of things out there that I can't explain and I don't need to is a really healthy place to be. And I think where a lot of, where, where we as humans get in trouble is that we're trying to explain things that we just don't have the data for. And that when we do that, we we end up, and this actually kind of leads into our next series that we're doing here at Unpacking Mormonism, which is like conspiracy theories and extreme thinking, polarized thinking or extremism. I'm sorry, extremism. So conspiracy theories, extremism, and polarized thinking. And, and that is, you know, when we need the answer to, to be a certain way. We need we need the answer to confirm what we already believe. Um, and we feel constantly threatened. And it cannot change our narrative of how the world is, the government is, our religion is, fill in the blank. We fall into these traps of conspiratorial thinking, which means there's a lack of flexibility of thinking. Our brain is closed off to to accepting new data as relevant no matter the source and we struggle with severe confirmation bias mm -hmm. and and really where that leads us is that we consistently feed into our own insecurity we live our life in constant fear constant fear and it stunts our ability to grow and change because a brain that's in constant fear can't learn new things. It's I, only willing to hear the same stuff that promotes circular reasoning. In fact, in Mormon General Conference, the Mormon prophet just said something along the lines of never take advice from people who believe differently than you. And I went. Oh huh? yeah, that was that was pretty what? extraordinary. Yeah, and a uh, shout out to whoever posted the meme that um, that connected that to David Koresh, you know, which is a bit extreme, but it was a uh, Kara Burrell. Was. Yeah, let yeah. me put that shout out. It's Kara Burrell who um, identifies on, I believe, TikTok as Nuance Ho. Um, yeah. So I want to take this moment. The whole reason that I even thought about this, and we came together about this show idea was I wanted to sort of like, you know, I guess put a put something in the mind of our listeners and to get something out there in general. To, it's almost like a warning. You don't have to be within a religious organization to be trapped in these uh, these these sort of like cult like behaviors. You can right. make a cult of your own personality. And I don't want to get down a huge rabbit hole about this, um, but this kind of really works hand in hand with um, digital addiction and social media, um, mm -hmm. because those things really work to validate your, um, your best and worst behaviors. You know, you, there is no bigger superstar on my phone than me. That's just 100% the case. Right. Um, and my <laughs> favorite quote, Selfies. and I don't remember the comedian, but I remember he said he was talking about how Facebook was thinking about charging money for the service. And he was like, charge me a thousand dollars a month as long as I get that sweet, sweet attention. And it made me laugh so hard. 
but you know that just works so well with that cult of personality and so i don't i'm not trying to shame any of our listeners i'm certainly not trying to shame myself but we really have to be mindful of making decisions in these veins of what we think is ourselves for exactly mm -hmm. the reason you said which is I'm trying to avoid having to think about what it would mean if I didn't agree with this, or if this did require more of myself, or if I wasn't the perfect blank. Um, and then you marry that with the fact that the phone is also telling you constantly, guess what, Kat, you're not perfect. Guess what, kid, you are horrible and not quite there. You better get your teeth fixed. You better get that therapy. You better get an energy drink. And so I just wanna marry those things together in this idea of like, you don't have to be in a cult to be caught in cult-like behaviors. Well, and I'm going to say that, oh, my sound just changed because I moved my microphone. Um, I'm going to say that <laughs> I want to say all, but I don't like all inclusive words. So almost all, but I can't think of one that doesn't fit. <laughs> um, <laughs> cult leaders are narcissistic. Um, and all humans, and this time I do mean, well, again, no, not all this time, almost all humans are going to have narcissistic tendencies. Um, and, and narcissistic tendencies are not always toxic. Um, it's okay to think about yourself. It's okay to have self-preservation. Um, it's okay to be proud of your accomplishments. Those are good things. Um, but when those things um, take over functioning and then cause harm or close off your thinking um, to others, it, it can become very, very dangerous. And so when you talk about kind of this, I'm creating my own cult within myself, usually what is going on is those narcissistic tendencies that most humans have are showing up in excess and in a way that is harming, self-destructive towards us, we're going to be experiencing extreme insecurities and we're going to want to control our environment in a way that is uncontrollable. And the ways that we are seeking control of our environment is also self-destructive. Um, and that's really, those are the things that, that we've really got to start looking, looking out for. You know, Alex, you asked me what is evil, and I think that evil, I do believe that evil exists in the world, and my definition of evil is intentionally and knowingly causing harm to another human without cause. Like, I believe in self-defense. If, if, if it was, you know, a choice between me protecting my son or my daughter from a perpetrator who is coming into my home and actively threatening us, I don't think I'd have a problem utilizing my gun. I'm grateful to live in the United States where I get to carry and have one in my home or multiples in my home. I'm very grateful for that. Chances of that happening in my home, very, very slim. But I am grateful to have that opportunity in my home. Um, in that case, I know that that would be traumatizing for me and my kids but I don't see a moral issue with me protecting and taking somebody's life in that case. Um, whereas if I was just cold-blooded murder, just for the sake of it, um, I think that that is pure evil, for sure. I think that extortion um, for personal gain is, is evil. Um, I think that knowing better and not actively trying to do better, whether or not you're succeeding, but not putting in the effort is problematic. I wouldn't say that was evil, but I would definitely say it's problematic and can definitely lead to evil. But when we talk about creating our own cults within our own minds, and, and usually once we've kind of created it for ourselves, then we start to pull others in. It, it very rarely stays with, with just us because as humans, most of us are going to seek like-minded people to join us in our thought processes. Well, and, and I, what I think, and this is, I'm not trying to give anyone a free pass at all. Um, sometimes right. cults, and I'm not speaking uh, about small things, I'm speaking of large things. Sometimes cults around people can happen 
and the people in the center of it don't even realize that they are in the midst of something because they are themselves fall, like surrounded by yes people. Um, right. And man, that just, it, that's, you know, sometimes that happens in small batches with alcoholics who have people who have a, you know, a group that protects them or, and again, I don't want to throw any particular addict well, under, but just addicts in general can have a group that sort of surrounds them and protects them from the real world um, right. for a variety of reasons. It doesn't really but matter. That, that show addicts. Yeah. Right. Because belonging to a community is a biological need. Right. As as humans, we need that connection. And so if my community is toxic, but I'm getting what I need from it, why am I gonna why am I gonna leave it? It it it's difficult. A toxic community, but where I feel safe and not judged is hard to leave. The number when we talk about addiction, the number one underlying cause for addictive behaviors is usually is usually attachment trauma. And mm -hmm. so if I'm in a community of addicts that love me that I feel attached to, it's going to be incredibly difficult to leave that community because they love me and they don't judge me and I need that and the substance is just a secondary problem. It's it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not the substance that's the problem. It's the community fills a need I, I couldn't get outside of that, outside I of that community. Like, I feel like we could do a whole show too on uh, nostalgia and the, the, oh, the, yeah. because sometimes when people get caught in a, a validation loop, it's not even like you said, it's not the drug. You're now into a, an area of I'm into this just because it's familiar. It's not even mm -hmm. like it's soothing me anymore. The notion of it being familiar is the soothing. And I, and that's just a whole nother thing. Um, and then I just wanted to say uh, as a quick shout out to my show, there is a reason for narcissism. It's uh, it's on stage. When you're on stage, we oftentimes like seeing narcissists because, you know, someone who does what it takes to get our attention in the moment is very pleasing to the eye to watch uh, in a performance capacity. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So that's, you know, it, it's funny because like that's, one of the things that we joke about on Stagecraft on my show is, you know, we, we're like, hey, are we talking about real life now? Or are we talking about on stage? <laughs> and, you know, and then sometimes it's like, you know, if you don't know that there's a difference, there might be a problem. <laughs> yes. Well, or or I was um, I read Beyond the Wand when I was on book tour while I was doing all of my driving to the different locations for my book tour. And um, uh, Tom Felton tells a story like he's, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. And some lady comes up to him and tells him he needs to be nicer to Harry Potter in the next series. And she's like dead serious. And he's like, are you on some? Like, <laughs> this is, this is fiction, but it wasn't fiction for her. Yeah. So sometimes the fans expect so much and, and it's, it's uncomfortable. Go Tom Felton. My daughter has a major crush on you, which is creepy because you're my age. And um, <laughs> oh, all right, I know you have so, to run. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have so to go here in a minute. I just I wanted to. Um, oh shoot, I just lost my thought. I had a really good one to close. Oh, so one of the things, Alex, one of the questions that we did not get to was you said a desire for power is problematic, and I'm gonna say yes, it is. But I don't think people desire power as much as they desire control. Um, when we talk about narcissistic power, we're really talking about narcissistic control, meaning I am going to try and control things no matter the cost to myself or the people around me. And, you know, we see this and, and, you know, we're not a political show, but I definitely see this like with, with Donald Trump, he will throw anybody under the bus so that he maintains control. Yes, it's a position of power that he's in, but it's about control. Um, Cause you, you asked me, Alex, and on your email, is that a desire for comfort? Um, when one of the biggest red flags that we are in a place that is harmful to ourselves, our others, is when we are trying to control things that we can't control. And it can be really hard to be honest with ourselves when we are there. And so, you know, when, when we're talking about, is this from trauma? Is this from my upbringing? Is this from my experiences? 
really it's about is what's going on for me and how I'm responding, is it working for me in a way that feels healthy? Yes or no? Am I controlling things that I shouldn't be controlling? And and if you can really be honest about your circle of control and if you're stepping outside of that circle or staying inside of that circle, that is where you have a great deal of healthy power to make positive change in your life. So I just wanted to end with that thought. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. You bet. And- hey, Alex, before yes. we go plug in your show, make sure that oh. everybody knows where we can find you and then I'll let you close out for today. Hey, everybody. Uh, if you want to check out more Alex Vidalis, you can go to Stagecraft. Just Google Stagecraft with Don and Alex and you will find our show. It's on WERA.FM. Just Google Alex and Don Stagecraft and we will come up. We have so many interviews with artists and musicians across the DMV and beyond. It's just a wonderful place to learn about how to share your artistic creation. Um, And Sarah, I just wanted to wrap up, uh, not to have the last word, you know, so important for people to keep themselves clear. Can you just remind people just super simply, like what are three things to keep your mind and your body at, you know, three things that everyone can do no matter you know what physical or mental spot you're in, what can we do to keep ourselves clear and making good decisions? Absolutely. Um, so number one, take care of your physiological needs. That means sleep healthy, um, fill your body with healthy nutrients, so healthy, clean food, stay hydrated, and healthy movement. I cannot state enough how important it is to take care of your physiological being. Number two, surround yourself with people who honor and love you unconditionally. And it's a huge bonus when they can do that in disagreement. In fact, I would highly recommend it. Um, Some of the best friends you will ever have are the ones that have different opinions and viewpoints than you. The goal is to surround yourself with a community of people who love you and embrace you for you, not because you think or feel or believe the same. And number three, when life gets hard, seek help. Doing things alone is not how humans were wired. We need help from people that you trust, preferably somebody with experience, but honestly, anybody you feel completely safe with that will honor your confidence and that you can honor their confidence, you're going to you're going to be doing better. So those are my three things for today. Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is hosted by Sarah and Mason Westbrook. Produced by Daisy Girl Communications, LLC and Alex Vidalis. Please join our community on Facebook. Music provided by Musa and John Worthy Music.